Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me along to speak about this. Um, I wasn't sure if this would be an interesting topic for people or not, but it seems like um, people are interested. You're all here, which is great. And it's something that I personally find quite interesting because I've been asked a lot of times, like, what's the difference? Aren't they the same thing? Um, and I think if you don't kind of work with people, maybe that do these jobs or you don't do them the yourself, it's not always obvious what the difference is. So hopefully we can uh, talk about that and I'll be interested to hear what some of you think about it as well. So if we move, oh, it's not moving. Is it moving on your screen? Hmm. It's a good start, right. I'm just gonna stop presenting for a second and go back. We did say that there would have to be a glitch, didn't we? <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's the rules. It has to be one. Let's see. Right, brilliant. I've got little buttons down here. Um, I always joke that it's like the, the technology that should be simpler to use that I find more difficult. <laughs> so there we go. So the, the answer to the question, uh, are they the same thing, is as, as is the answer to a lot of life's important questions, it depends. Um, so I wanted to caveat this with saying that I think there are different types of data scientists and data engineers in different organizations. So I'm going to be speaking about the, the roles as they are, as I've experienced them. But thinking uh, specifically maybe about data engineers, you have data engineers that are more like platform engineers. So they build tools and things. And then you have others at the other end of the spectrum that work kind of directly with data analysts and data scientists. So that's the type of data engineer that I'm going to be speaking about in this talk. Um, and again, there is also a wide range of um, data scientists as well. So you could be kind of at the end of Google DeepMind, you know, working on really, really cutting edge stuff. And then all the way back to being maybe an analyst that builds uh, dashboards and, and does kind of more basic data analytics. So there is a wide range in these roles. And so the things that I'm going to talk about won't necessarily apply to all of them, but hopefully you'll recognize at least something in here um, and it will be useful. So this is kind of how I would explain this to my mum, you know, when she asked me, what's the, what's the difference between the roles? What do you do? Um, to me, data engineering is like this plumber on the left. So it's like the plumbing of data science. It's kind of getting all that raw material, making sure that it reliably gets from A to B, making sure that it's in like a usable state. So we want it to be clean. We want it to be usable. And we want people to know how, how they can use that. Um, so it should be obvious kind of the tooling, like the pipes that the plumber puts in, it should be obvious how to use those. And then on the far right, the data scientists, this one doesn't fit as nicely into the analogy, I don't think, but I kind of think of them as the people that would maybe be using that raw material, so the water in this case, to create something interesting and useful to people. So in this case, a water fountain, but it could be anything. Um, anything that is actually usable and useful to an end user that doesn't necessarily care about all the plumbing and the pipes and things like that. They just want that kind of end product. So this is how I would explain it to people that maybe don't work in these jobs um, or that just want a very, very kind of easy, like high level explanation. So if there's one thing to take away, I think this is probably it as to what the difference is. So, um, oh, I've actually, oh, sorry. Yeah, it's working. <laughs> Good. You can still see the slides, can't you? Cool. OK, so I think both of these roles, so when I talk about them being different, I think they're both incredibly important. So that's not to put them into any kind of hierarchy. Um, I think data science is the kind of more, I'd say uh, most more people have heard of data scientists. Um, and in some ways, it's the, the sexier role. So when you think of that, you think of like machine learning and, and AI and all that sort of thing, which you may or may not be doing in that role. But both of these roles are incredibly important. And actually you find that a lot of companies when they are setting up a data practice, it's the data engineering side that they will need to get in place first to kind of build that foundation. So getting the data in a state that then you can bring in a data scientist or a data analyst to actually use it um, and understand it. So there's an awful lot of data wrangling work and foundational work that has to go on before you can do the kind of more interesting things or at least the things that are more visible to other people in the organization. So I quite like this picture on the left um, where you've got the data engineer kind of holding up some of the work I suppose that the data scientist does. And that's again, not to say that one of them is more important than the other, only that they are very kind of dependent on each other. So they need each other to be able to do the work that they do. Um, and usually one person, it's, it's possible, but usually one person won't possess the skills to do both of those roles. So, and this depends to some extent on the size of the organization. So in smaller ones, you might have uh, data scientists doing data engineering and vice versa. But as the organization grows and there is more data and there are more demands on the data team, you'd expect those roles to be separated out and to get people that are very good in one of those domains. 
because they're both really vast fields um, and it's it would be very impressive if someone were kind of excellent at both of those things i'm sure those people exist but there probably aren't many of them so generally um it's a good thing to have people that kind of specialize in each of these areas and can bring uh, their kind of unique skills to the team. So I put this in um, just to walk through an example of where these kind of roles might actually fit in, um, because I think, again, if you don't do them, it's kind of like, okay, yeah, I kind of get it, like the data engineer is doing plumbing and then the data scientist is doing something to do with waterfalls, but like, where does that, where does that actually fit into a project? So Starting on the kind of far left here, you've got, if you imagine that you have a company that builds an app, for example, and that's producing logs. So every time the user does something in the app, that's producing logs like data, a stream of data that comes out of that. And you'd be storing that in some kind of transactional database. And that would generally be optimized for speed um, because the app has to run quickly. So you want to be able to update the data, read the data and write it very quickly. Um, that's a very different sort of database to the kind that you'd have a data engineer or a data scientist, work, scientist sorry, working off of. So generally, your, the data, one of the data engineer's jobs is to get that data and put it into this other kind of database, so a data warehouse, one that is kind of optimized for analytics work. Um, so I put some examples down here. You can see on the far left, you've got things like MongoDB, which is like a document database, um, MySQL, you've probably, probably worked with some of these, um, and Bigtable, which is a Google Cloud uh, platform product. But when we're looking at the data warehouses that the data engineer works with, um, it's more things like Amazon Redshift, Google BigQuery, Snowflake, which is a fairly new one. And these are optimized to be able to crunch large amounts of data really quickly. Um, so kind of gone are the days when you had to sit there and probably wait literally days uh, for your query to run over large amounts of data. It's, it's super fast now. And that kind of opens up a lot more opportunity. And then you can also see that at the top here, um, we've got things like Google Analytics and CRM systems like Salesforce, and there are, there are lots of others that also the data engineer would be building, sort of writing code to speak to APIs for these systems and pull all of that data into one place. So the data warehouse should be a nice, clean, kind of usable uh, data layer for people to work with. And then on the far right, the data scientist, it could also be an analyst, be using a lot of tools to analyze that data. So Python um, in Jupyter Notebooks are a very popular one these days, just because they're really easy to use and you can kind of document your code as you write it, um, which is excellent. So they're very popular. Um, also Looker, I imagine maybe some of you already work with Looker, that's a really popular one. And there are lots of other kind of BI tools as well um, that people be using. But Generally, this is at the point when a lot of that foundation work has been done already in the data warehouse to make the data usable for someone so that they can just plug in one of these BI tools and it's kind of very easy and straightforward or easier than it would have been to work with that data. So that just gives you a kind of general idea of where each of the roles fit in. So I just wanted to kind of refresh that and just go over some of the specific um, skills really that each of the roles would have. So like I said, I think you'd need both of them, um, or at least you need both skill sets to kind of have a really good uh, data practice, or at least one that is kind of smooth and, and low stress, I think, for the people involved. So on the far left, the data engineer will generally be very good at things like writing data pipelines, uh, cleaning and transforming data. They would have a good knowledge of data modeling. So how do you actually structure the data when you get it into the warehouse so that it is easy and intuitive to use? Um, depending on what kind of data engineer they are, they might be very good at working with distributed systems as well. Um, so thinking about how to not only get that data, but do it in the most efficient way. So when you start working with um, cloud resources, for example, they obviously cost money um, and generally you're paying for the amount of data that you're processing. So if you can think of ways to do that more efficiently, you're going to keep the cost down and obviously keep your, your boss very happy. And then things like testing as well, making sure that you can ensure like the integrity of your data pipelines and you know that things go wrong early rather than finding out kind of when you've got incorrect data in the data warehouse is very important. Um, and I've kind of gone into languages and tools. This very much depends on the company that you work for. These are just some common ones. So SQL, always SQL, but then you might also have Python, uh, Scala and Java as well, depending on the kind of organization you work for. And I think, um, the interesting thing is that when you get to languages and tools between the two of these, there's a lot of crossover. So SQL and Python appear on both sides. Um, and that kind of speaks to the fact that these are separate but related kind of roles. Um, but you can see that the data scientist is much more focused on that end product. So the actual analysis when you've got the data in place, um, data visualization is a very big one because obviously that's the kind of easiest way usually to communicate something to an end user. Um, AB testing, communication is a very big part of it. And you may or may not be doing like machine learning as well. So I put that in there. 
but generally you'd be looking for them to have more of that analytical curiosity whereas the data engineer typically is more um, of has more of that engineering curiosity so how can we do this faster and more efficiently um, and get things where they need to be so I also wanted to talk about, so you probably know it's my, my job title. Um, I will go back and introduce myself properly at the end. It skipped past those slides, so I will do that. But if you uh, were BDI, you would have noticed that my job title is analytics engineer, not data engineer. So um, I did used to work as a data engineer. And the reason I took the um, analytics engineering job is because I thought this was a really interesting kind of emerging, more emerging area um, of data and a role that probably is even less familiar, I imagine, to a lot of people than the data engineer. Um, so this role, there's, there's some really good articles here that I've kind of linked to that you can go and read afterwards, but essentially this role came out of this shift towards using more cloud resources. So things like Google Cloud Platform, BigQuery that we spoke about, Data Warehouse, um, AWS and their Redshift Data Warehouse, and also um, cloud or SaaS based tools like Fivetran and Stitch, which you also might have worked with. These are like ETL tools. So you can basically plug them into systems that you have, maybe like Salesforce that we spoke about earlier. And it will make it very easy to get that data into your data warehouse. So no longer do you have to write custom code um, to do a lot of this ETL. You can kind of focus your time on the arguably the more complicated stuff like the business logic and how you're actually going to analyze the data. So obviously this frees up a lot of time. Um, you don't necessarily need the army of data engineers that you needed before if you've got tools that can kind of automate some of that. And what that led to was opening up this role of the analytics engineer, because typically um, in the past, a data engineer would be very focused on the systems and sort of ETL, getting the data from A to B, but they don't necessarily empathize always with the people that are using that data, so the analysts and the data scientists. So there was a recogn recognition, sorry, that you needed to have something in the middle that kind of understood um, how to get the data, but also how to make it usable. So analytics friendly is the uh, term that they use. Um, and I kind of think that the, the easiest way to kind of think of that is that you want it to be so that the analyst doesn't have to go and read loads of documentation about how that data, how the tables, sorry, are structured and things like that. It should be very obvious and very intuitive when they look at it. And it takes a bit of skill to do that. So you have to understand the domain, for example, um, what the data is actually about. You have to kind of understand how the analyst or the data scientist is going to use it. And that's essentially the thinking behind the analytics engineer. So somebody that can take the raw material that maybe the data engineer has got into the warehouse and then build that out into an analytics friendly uh, set of uh, tables so that the analysts and the scientists don't have to worry too much about doing all of that work. So it frees them up. So that's where the analytics engineer comes in. Um, and there's a slight different focus um, in terms of tools and things as well. So I mentioned Fivetran and Stitch, um, two tools that kind of automate the ETLs, so actually getting the data from system A into your warehouse would be. Um, but there's also a couple of other interesting tools that have popped up uh, over the past couple of years. So DBT data build tool is a really interesting one. And um, I think if you work in data now, kind of regardless of, of the role that you have, that's a really cool one to go and, and look up. So it basically um, tries to add some of the rigor from software engineering into the work of data analysts. So if you, if you think you might spend a lot of time, for example, writing SQL queries that join two tables together, and then a couple of weeks later, you might want to do that again, or you might want to do that and then build something on top of it. Um, what at the moment that kind of relies on you sending maybe that query to one of your colleagues so they can use it as well, or you have to save it somewhere and then go and get it later. But with DBT, you can write all of this as a set of models um, that can then be like GitHub um, and run automated on a schedule. So it means that you don't have to necessarily have to do a lot of that thinking around like scheduling, um, version control and everything yourself. It, it comes with a lot of that stuff included, plus a lot of other really cool features. So that's a really good one to check out. And then another example is Great Expectations, which is um, essentially a testing framework on top of data. So when we write pipelines, generally it's, it's very hard to test data. It's very easy to test code, um, but it's usually data that breaks our pipelines, so unexpected data. So, uh, you know, missing fields and things like that. And there aren't really many tools that kind of make it easy to test for that. So Great Expectations is like an attempt at doing that. And that's become very popular in recent years as well. So, and then another one that's like really interesting and, and definitely worth checking out. And they both have excellent kind of Slack channels as well. Um, can learn a lot from those. So I recommend checking those out. And then finally, just to kind of wrap, I suppose this section up, um, We've said that they're different roles, but they do have a lot in common as well. I think probably if you work in data already, you know this, um, but curiosity is the main thing. Um, 
certainly to be a data scientist, you're kind of digging into problems all the time and you kind of, you've got to make sure that you don't just take the first answer or the obvious answer. You kind of verify the things you're looking at. Is that actually why something's happening? Or looking at a data set, it's showing you maybe something about the user, but what's not there. Um, so that's kind of quite important. That's always been important in that realm. And I think similarly with the data engineers and the analytics engineers, um, you need to dig into things like what could go wrong with this data set, what could go wrong with this pipeline and making sure that you build the, the required testing and alerting and everything in. So curiosity is very important. I think again, if you work in data, desire to keep learning, we know that the world moves very quickly. Um, anything to do with technology moves incredibly quickly. So you'll be forever learning new, new techniques, new languages, new approaches and so on. And um, I'll speak a little bit later about some uh, ways I suppose that I try and keep up with that stuff that you might find useful if you've not come across them already. Desire to understand the business problem. I think I kind of said earlier that data engineers are perhaps usually a bit more removed from that um, compared to the data scientists and analysts that are kind of directly answering big business problems. But the more you can take, I suppose, take an interest and understand the domain you work in, the better the work's going to be. And the more you can kind of empathize with the colleagues that you work for as well. Um, and that makes you yeah, a better data person in general. So I think that's very important. So like I said, empathy is, is a big one. And then the ability to translate between the technical and the non-technical, I think is very important because ultimately when, even if you work in data, maybe you do have a highly technical role, it's usually the, the data is there for a reason. It's not an end in and of itself. So in order for people to kind of use that and within the company and, and get something out of it and use it to make decisions, they need to understand kind of how it was, how it came to be, um, the decisions that you made to get it there, how it's structured and everything. And if if that is kind of hidden behind a wall of technical jargon that they can't understand, it's, it's never going to have the impact that it needs to have um, in the organization. So I think being able to empathize with non-technical employees and translate between the technical and non-technical is, is also very important for each of these roles. So just before I get into this, I'm just going to try and go back to the start and actually introduce myself, which unfortunately that was my uh, lack of ability to use Google Slides made me skip over that because I think this will give a bit more context. <laughs> so let's go back to here. Cool, there we go. So this was supposed to be the first slide. <laughs> so uh, my name is Devin, um, which you probably already know by now. And um, as I kind of alluded to earlier, I work at Spotify as an analytics engineer. So that gives a bit more background for why I was speaking about uh, that role at the end. Um, and I guess we're a bit further through now, but do feel free to interrupt me if you have questions um, at any point. This was the one that I wanted to talk about a little bit more. So to give you some um, some more context, this was this is a very messy slide, but I think the career has been messy and it is messy. So it's kind of uh, apt, really. So on the far left, the top far left corner, um, I, yeah, I don't have a traditional kind of STEM background. So I studied anthropology and risk and security at university. I found them interesting. There was no, no greater reason than that, really. Um, I didn't know what else I wanted to do. And yeah, I have, I have no regrets about that. They were super interesting topics and I got a lot out of that. But then I ended up joining the Lloyds Banking Group Graduate Scheme um, just as a generalist, because again, I didn't know what, what I was doing. Um, but kind of at that time, so that was when, it feels like a while ago now, but that was when FinTech was becoming like a word that people would speak about more and more. It was no longer like a niche. So Monzo, I think, started around that time um, and a few other kind of challenger banks. And so there was this real um, buzz like within the bank around technology. And I was like, oh, like, I don't, I don't know how any of this works. Like I find it also interesting, but I don't have the foundation to really understand it. So I started um, basically looking around for teams in the bank that worked with data and technology. And I came across one that was like an analytics team and they used R, the programming language R at the time. And I was very, very lucky in that I started spending time learning that outside of work and ended up being able to kind of convince them to give me a job essentially um, off of the graduate scheme working in the data team. So that's what kind of started it off. And, and that was a bit of a whim. I didn't really know, you know, much about what that involved, but I just thought this is really interesting. And the kind of studying that I was doing seemed really interesting. And it seemed like the way the world was going at the time. So I started doing that. Um, and getting involved in meetup groups. So I joined the AI club, which is another, um, similarly to this one, another meetup group focused on data. And that led to me switching into my first data engineering role also in the bank. Um, and whereas I'd been using R before, I ended up learning a bit of Python there and getting into things like Hadoop and Spark, other kind of like data engineering um, infrastructure, which was really interesting. Um, after that, I moved to, to work 
also a house, which is like a private members club. They were starting up their, um, I suppose, data practice when I joined. So I was the second data engineer that they hired. And what was really interesting about this is that I think it's quite rare that you get to sort of design the infrastructure from scratch, which is what we got to do in that case, because there wasn't anything to begin with. So picking exactly which tools we wanted to use, um, which was just great and kind of seeing how everything um, is built up from scratch. So that was really useful. And they used um, Python as well and Go, which is another language. I don't think that's a common uh, one for data engineering, but it was, um, yeah, it was good fun learning that. And then from there, um, moved into analytics engineering at Spotify only, only very recently, sort of December last year. Um, but again, Python, Python has been like the common theme throughout all of those, Google Cloud Platform, and then also Scala which is another um, common data engineering language. So yeah, that's, um, they've all been quite different, but um, it was a really kind of interesting journey, I suppose, to go through and have all these things and so on and approaches to working with data in each of those places. So now I'm gonna skip back again <laughs> to the end um, and go through some tips that I would give um, if you're kind of interested in these roles. So let's put this back up. So I try to make this um, general. So I think this will apply to probably any, any I'd say any job, just certainly any technical job and especially data roles. So my first one is to not guess at what to learn. I think if you're kind of at the start of that journey um, and you know which kind of job you want to go for, it's, it's kind of, um, so I notice a lot of the time when people ask me like, oh, I want to be a data scientist, for example, how do I do that? that they haven't actually looked at job ads for those roles to kind of get really concrete about what it is they have to learn. And I think that's just fear. It's, it's like fear of um, maybe seeing something you don't want to see almost like a long list of technologies, but the kind of more concrete you can get earlier on, you'll have like a roadmap then for what you want to learn. So it just makes it a lot easier. Um, and I wrote actually role roadmaps there. So I've linked to a few of those later in the presentation, but there are things like the data scientist roadmap, the data engineer roadmap. And you should always take these things with a pinch of salt because it does matter. Um, it does change rather based on which company you want to work for and so on, even which country. But it's good just to have a plan and to have something structured. So that would be the first one. Um, second one I'd say is immersing yourself in the community. So just by virtue of being here, you're doing that already, which is excellent. Um, but also getting involved in Slack groups. There's loads of really good ones. So I mentioned um, DBT, Great Expectations. A lot of these tools have their own Slack channels and you can learn an immense amount from other people that are just discussing these tools and discussing the ways they've approached different problems and so on. So that can be a, a really good idea. Even if you never end up using those tools, it can just be excellent to learn that way. Um, newsletters and also podcasts, I think, especially because you can just put them on whilst you're doing, you know, cleaning or whatever around the house, um, that can be a really good way of getting in a bit more learning. Um, there's a lot of really good ones related to data science, data engineering, or just general technical topics. So these are really good for building up context. And like it says, reducing your unknown unknowns, because I think that's kind of the hardest thing. Um, if you join a new field, you don't even know what you don't know yet. So it kind of helps you to build up a bit more of a roadmap as well. Um, my third one is to avoid getting stuck in tutorial hell. And I think this matters even kind of if you have got the job already and you're just learning new things, it's very easy to just endlessly take tutorials um, and never actually go and build anything. And it, I think it's only when you actually try to build something and it goes wrong that you learn kind of, you learn how to get yourself out of those situations. But tutorials are usually designed so that nothing can go wrong. So it's a good place to start, but make sure you kind of quickly move on from that um, so that you kind of get, get the scars that are sometimes required to actually have the experience and the confidence to, to do that work um, at work as well. And then fourth one, I just, say make a structured plan because I think like we said earlier these are vast fields there's a hell of a lot to learn and they change incredibly quickly so it's very easy to be overwhelmed um, by how much there is going on so as as far as is possible and it's difficult to do and I don't always take my own advice either but try and focus on one thing at a time and don't expect it to happen overnight either if you're trying to learn like a new thing especially if you are moving jobs or starting a new career it's, um, it does just take time and you'll be doing that for the rest of the career because things do change so quickly. So make it sustainable um, and try and just pick one thing at a time and go with that. Um, so those would be yeah, my, my tips really, I think, for anyone trying to do that. Yeah, and that's, that's it. Thank you very much. I know I speak incredibly quickly, so I hope that was understandable. Um, so yeah, if you do have any questions, feel free and I'll try my best to answer them.